we're going to look at some history of reformers within the Bible. Um, I think, hopefully, the ones that understand why it's a necessary part of learning, whether it be the Bible in perspective and history or the history of how things have remained or changed, it's necessary to reflect on the Reformation. This is a particular lesson we can, again, learn from. Second Kings, if you will, in chapter 10. And the Bible has many different reformers, if you will. Well, two weeks ago we looked at Jehoshaphat, and he was bringing reform. In 2 Kings chapter 10, Jehu gathered all the people together and said unto them, Ahab serve Baal a little, Jehu shall serve him much. Now, therefore call unto me all the prophets of Baal, all his servants, all his priests, let none be wanting, for I have a great sacrifice to do to Baal. Whatsoever shall be wanting, he shall not live. But Jehu did, he did it in subtlety. The, the intent was that he might destroy the worshipers of Baal. So he proclaimed a solemn assembly for Baal. And they proclaimed it. And Jehu sent throughout all Israel, and all the worshipers of Baal came, so that there was not a man left that came not. And they came into the house of Baal. I underline this in my Bible. And the house of Baal was full from one end to another. Just remember that. You know, God's not against crowds gathering or mega churches. It's not. But uh, just, I underline this in my Bible. And the house of Baal was full from one end to another. It's amazing when you're preaching a false god, people will line up. He said unto him that was over the vestry, Bring forth vestments for all the worshippers of Baal. He brought them forth vestments. And Jehu went, and you've got this whole interesting what's going to happen here with all of these different rituals. The most important thing is Jehu says, Four score men are appointed without. If any one of the men whom I have brought into your hands escape, him that letteth him go his life shall be for the life of the man that escapes. It came to pass as soon as he made an end of offering, the burnt offering that Jehu said to the guard and to the captains, go in and slay them all, go kill them all. All these Baal worshippers gathered in one place, filled up the building, go kill them all. That's one way to reform. But if you really think about it, this is no different than what went on during the time of the Crusades or at other times. There's, there's no way to say it. If there's something that needs to be removed, you remove it. I'm talking about those who are on a mission, or so they think. What's ironic about this is, of course, you know that all the men that are gathered are destroyed. Just as Jehu gives the order that none should depart, none should get away. It says, Jehu, at verse 28, destroyed Baal out of Israel. How be it from the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, who made Israel to sin, Jehu departed not after them to wit the golden calves that were in Bethel and that were in Dan. In other words, it, it was just not enough to wipe out the worshipers and their altars if he wasn't going to take it all the way and remove the idols set up at Dan and Bethel. And, you know, this, in light of what I just spoke about today, about wanting to reform, you cannot, you cannot have a reformed movement without essentially a cutting away or breaking away, which eventually did develop, uh, but you can't hold on to some little portion of this ritual, get rid of everything else and hold on to this because I, I, I like this or I want to keep this. In this case, it's the calves at Dan and Bethel. 
And of course, if you keep reading on, there's, it's this whole passage in 2 Kings, which is obviously mirror, mirrored in 2 Chronicles. You've got a picture of these certain people through, peppered through these chapters who are trying to reform in one way or another. You've got the priest, Joida, who has Joash uh, secreted away and this last seed or last remnant of David's line who will rise up again and present another concept of reform. And it was primarily the priest Jehoiada who made sure that this reformation would take place. It seems very apparent to me in reading just these passages. The one that comes after this, uh, chapter 11, tells about Jehoiada the priest. It seems very apparent that God has to bring a man or a woman to the place of standing and not wavering and saying, regardless of the, the consequences, this must be done. And it's one of the reasons why Martin Luther is an attractive personality to me in history. It's another reason why Dr. Scott is an attractive person, uh, among many reasons, but in, in terms of the person's and life ministry. When people, when I hear people talk about uh, Dr. Scott and say things and say, well, you know, he was really out there. He taught on these subjects, but he had a manner of telling you you didn't have to stop living to be a Christian, nor did you or should you engage in hypocrisy. You know, what Tozer called the same business on the other side of the street. If you're going to be a Christian, be one. Know what you stand for. Know what you believe. And you work out your salvation with fear and trembling between you and God. You work it out. Now, I read these people in the Bible as uh, a clear warning for us today. And certainly Martin Luther is one in a line of a few in the pages of history. It should be a warning for us that if the church is so consumed to uh, emulate and mimic the world, we've lost sight of why eternally we exist, what our eternal purpose is, why we're here. I queried a few people, and I'd asked, uh, what was the basis of the Reformation? What was the point? What was going on? And to my surprise, or should I say maybe not surprised, the bulk of the people that I asked in different areas from different perspectives had little or no clue. And these are people that go to church all the time. They had little or no clue. That even reinforced a greater issue inside of me of why we need to present these type of messages periodically. No wonder why we go so easily astray. No wonder why people are... Uh, so hung up on whatever the doctrine du jour is. And uh, if you remember, I'm pointing this out for a reason, because somewhere there has to be a middle road of balance where the pendulum is realigned. I believe Martin Luther did that. He realigned. I believe Dr. Scott, for his time, realigned and kept people in check. He kept the ones that were towing the line a little bit to the extreme over, he kept them in check. And the ones that had crossed over the line over there, they knew who they were. And they were probably more in check than they'd profess to want to say. But I say this for a reason. If you remember Dr. Scott telling about the Von Bowman syndrome, how, you know, it's wonderful to preach grace, but then that becomes the license. If you preach, if all you do is preach grace, then that becomes the license for people to cross the line of, well, it's all good, so it doesn't matter. And that's why Bon Bowman had to bring in Dr. Scott on a somewhat regular basis in the early days while he traveled as a speaking minister to come in and be the straight stick that intermittently, while Grace was going forth from Bon Bowman's church, he'd intermittently have to come in and be the, the rod of correction to say, attitude check, you know, you, you take your spiritual inventory. Now, I'm, I'm giving my... 2010 version. You take your spiritual inventory and get real. I'm not wanting to be your inventory taker, but these are the dilemmas. It either goes so far to the extreme, one way or another, and the balance, the balance must be found. 
And that's why I highlighted somebody like Jehu who took matters, whether God uh, ordered him to do such a thing or whether this seemed like a good thing, in wiping out all the prophets of Baal and tearing down the, the house, it really didn't bring the necessary reform because the one missing ingredient still peppered the land. There were still people worshiping idols. You can never and will never eradicate it. But you can be the beacon of truth like in the next chapter of Second Kings, like the priest Jehoiada who at least lifted the banner in bringing forth the young king Joash, bringing forth the crown to place on his head and God's word, which are the two center points to bring on at least some kind of reform. You can't just by eliminating worship practices bring on reform. That, that's not going to do it. But God's word hoisted up, lifted clear above everything, will illuminate the way for those who have the eyes to see. So I'm just, uh, just going to keep looking to these scriptures every once in a while when I seem to get a little low in my spirit because I think nobody seems to care about God's word. And believe me, I'm, now I'm telling you true confessions here, probably saying too much. But it grieves me to the core to have to at least ask somebody. You know, I asked somebody about Martin Luther, and, and I was very specific to say in the 1500s, Martin Luther. And I could not, this should have been man on the street. The person said, I didn't think Martin Luther lived that long ago. And I, I, I immediately I thought, this person is confused with Martin Luther King. <laughs> yeah, I should have made this man on the street. We should have done a video while I asked the questions, and you all could have been going, huh? Or like Newman does. <laughs> but this is why it's important. So uh, like I said, I'll just keep doing what I do and uh, lifting, raising the banner of his word. And hopefully it matters enough to some of you to bring your bodies to church. You don't have to come to church to be a Christian. Your presence in the building is an encouragement to me as I encourage other people. That should be crystal clear. When I come into the sanctuary and there's not a very good attendance, the first thing that comes to my mind, believe me, it's not an ego trip, the first thing that comes to my mind is, well, do people just not care? Or is it just doesn't matter? Or is it because it's not a popular thing? Or this, you know, you, you've got to go the whole spectrum until I come back to sit right down here and say, your presence matters. It's not going to be whether you make it into heaven or not, or there's no criteria contingent upon, except you're encouraging me as I encourage a listening audience around the world. And don't think that people are not listening all around the world. They are. Like I said, it really does matter to me. Your presence is uh, a ministry to me as I minister to others. That's a good way of saying it. So I need you to get on the telephone, make your reservations, get busy.